Hello and welcome to Virtual College Exploration for all New Jersey residents. A uh, few housekeeping things I want to cover with you. Um, if you need to ask questions of any of our representatives, you can use the Q&A button to type your questions to presenters at any point during the presentation. Uh, your camera and microphone should always be turned off, please. Um, um, feel free to sign up for more sessions. Uh, you can check out our schedule on www.njacac.org backslash virtual fair and the recording will be available um, at that same website within a few days. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter. Okay, can everybody see the slides okay? Perfect. Okay, well welcome everybody. We're so happy to have you here today and, and tuning in to hear about our universities. My name is Caroline Ward. I am with William & Mary, and my role as an assistant dean includes having New Jersey as a region, so it's very happy to talk to you all today. Um, the other universities present include Miami University, Miss Emily Morris, and then University of Vermont with Candace Duckworth. So we're going to present about the public ivies of the East, uh, and those include our three institutions, and we'll kind of dive into the definition of public ivies of the, public ivies in general, actually, so pretty exciting. So I'll pass it on so we can do a brief introduction of each other. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Morris. I'm a Senior Assistant Director of Regional Enrollment um, for Miami University, which is based in Oxford, Ohio. I do live on the East Coast as a regional admission counselor and recruit in New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight and I'll hand it over to Candace. Hey guys, my name is Candace Duckworth. I'm the Regional Associate Director of Admissions for the University of Vermont. Um, I get to live down here in New Jersey and work with all the students in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Thanks for coming tonight. And my name is Caroline Ward. I'm with William & Mary, and my regions include New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware as well. Um, and I live in Williamsburg, Virginia, right near campus. Um, so pretty, pretty excited to, to be here today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and explain kind of the history of where the word public ivy came from. Um, there's this guy named Richard Mall who actually wrote a book that's the cover of the book that you do see there on what a public ivy is. It is a public institution, we're all public institutions, but that educational experience is on par with that Ivy League level. So this is not something that we dubbed upon ourselves, um, it's something that someone kind of shared with a handful of um, universities across the board. So there are eight original public ivies and in a second Caroline's going to go over that um, but since that original eight was, was suggested in 1985, more have been added. Um, so keep that in mind. This is something that originated by a guy named Richard Mall. So we're excited to be um, part of that original eight group of having that incredible public Ivy institution, public university with that Ivy League feel. So Caroline, let's go ahead and keep going and you can kind of share those additional public Ivies. Yes, thank you so much, Emily. So this is kind of a slide showing those original public ivies, like, like we mentioned, the eight originals. So included in those originals include William & Mary, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Miami University, the University of Virginia, the University of Michigan, the University of Vermont, the University of Texas at Austin, and then the University of California. So those are ones to consider uh, in terms of public ivies. Those were the original eight that Mr. Mott came up with um, and shared uh, about his background. And then I also want to share those runner ups. So the ones later added, those newer ones added, um, also known as the runner ups. So these include the University of Pitt Pittsburgh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, University of Colorado Boulder, Penn State, the University of Washington, and then also um, Binghamton, excuse me, I always trip over that word, University, State University of New York, University of South Florida, and Georgia Tech. 
So something to think about when you're considering public IVs, and as Emily mentioned, that definition of public IVs, um, those are the kind of the two main lists there. Great. So, um, you know, some of the things that uh, Richard Ball highlighted in his book of why he decided these schools were considered public IVs. Um, it would be the high quality academics. Um, the schools that he chose, all of us here, uh, were selected because they offer um, an academically rigorous curriculum in both liberal arts and STEM fields um, for students, including smaller like honors programs. So really uh, students at public IVs are able to get um, the Ivy League, a quality education of a, a, you know, a more elite private school, but at the public school um, kind of price. Um, the size of our schools are all typically, you know, medium to large state schools, and that state school is, again, what makes us a public IV. So you're going to find a whole wide variety of divisions for athletics, um, a wide variety of clubs and organizations, and really everything, um, the social side of everything that you'd be considering in your college search. And then again, the affordability piece is really, um, you know, why this designation was, I think, made along with the academics for, for being more affordable than maybe a private school. Um, so many of these, if you're a resident um, in state at these different institutions, you're going to benefit by paying that in state tuition cost. Um, but overall, um, these institutions offer merit scholarships and generous financial aid, even for their out of state students to help make um, the college process more affordable. So I think now we're going to go through and give you a little bit more specific information about all of our unique institutions. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. And as we go through kind of these personal slides of our specific universities, you'll, you'll definitely see why these particular schools were designated a public ID. Um, Miami University is absolutely beautiful. Um, I always like to kick off saying I, I was a student. I was an out-of-state student to Miami University. I'm originally from Southern California. My sister actually went to Miami first, and I thought, where are you going? What in the world is in Ohio, M Midwest? I had no concept of of the of the state and all the great schools that are in Ohio and moved her in her first year Scott for the first time I was a sophomore in high school and fell in love it is exactly what you picture college to look like to feel like it is breathtaking um, so besides the beauty of campus our academics are incredible we do have over 120 majors to choose from we have a few direct admit programs business school, our nursing program, and creative arts, things that require an audition or portfolio, those are designated in our um, direct admit programs. But we have so many different options to choose from, and we are heavily focused on that undergraduate experience. You'll see we're on that bigger end of mid-size with just over 17,000 undergraduate students. We don't have a ton of grad students, and I think that's what I love most about my academic experience at Miami is all the big stuff, the big projects, research, internships, leadership roles, was geared towards that undergraduate experience. I could do it right away. I didn't have to wait till my senior year to, to gain seniority to lead a big project. Um, if you wanna do research, you can do that your freshman year, which is pretty great. We are a division one school. We do have varsity athletics. You'll see a picture of an ice rink there. Who, who would have thought uh, Ohio school with big ice sports? We have a great hockey program. One of our recent alum actually won the Stanley Cup two nights ago, which was really exciting. Um, so you have that school spirit piece with the Division I athletics. Um, we're residential. You're required to live on campus those first two years. Uh, juniors and seniors live off campus, but you see about 98% live within a two mile radius. Where the academic part of campus ends, our juniors and seniors, that's where they start. Um, so they're still walking to class. They still feel like they're part of the experience. Um, in terms of the extracurriculars, there's, there's so much to get involved. Miami is that quintessential college experience. The academics are amazing. Again, why we're considered a public Ivy. But at the same time, all that fun stuff, getting involved, um, joining a fraternity or a sorority or joining our esports program and, and managing your academic stuff and your fun stuff at the same time on such a gorgeous campus, that, that's that quintessential college town feel. Um, so that's a little bit overview. Um, in terms of, uh, Caroline, feel free to click the next slide for me there. In terms of, of where we see students go, um, unfortunately, it's only four years. Right, it's a traditional four-year program. Something's got to come next, but we'll we'll help you get there. 
whether it's graduate school, full-time employment, and it's okay if you don't know what that is quite yet. Um, during your time, you'll have access to an incredible career services program that will help you get to that next step. Over 96% of our students are either um, employed or fully enrolled in furthering their education within six months of graduation. Um, it's a traditional four-year graduation rate. Most of our students are graduating in four years or less. Um, if you're thinking about law school, that's a great option for us. But again, it's okay if you don't know exactly what the next step is. Just know that Miami has incredible faculty and staff in place to help you navigate your four years and then whatever's going to come next. In terms of the application process, we are on the Common App. Once you fill that Common Application out and you do submit it, you're automatically considered for our Merit Scholarship. So this is when we pull in that affordability of a Ivy type school with that public, uh, public school sticker price, okay? This is guaranteed if you meet these GPA minimums. Miami will be test optional this year. Um, we know some students might not have an opportunity to take a test at all. It's okay, this is truly optional. If you wanna submit one, you can. If you don't want to, totally fine. How this will work is we will um, take a look at your GPA based on a 4.0 scale. If your school's not on a 4.0 scale, we'll, we'll get you there. Um, but if you do fall within these ranges, you're guaranteed that non-resident um, scholarship that's out of state, those ranges. How, how to get on that higher end of the, those ranges is uh, the rigor of coursework at the, at the school that you're at. What does your high school offer? Are you taking advantage of those APs or honors courses or IB programs? And then the number of applicants applying in, in similar ranges, okay? Again, guaranteed if you meet these ranges, and if you are below that 3.5 GPA, you're still automatically considered for this. Another piece of the puzzle before I hand it off to our next university, um, I encourage you to apply early action for Miami. That is a December 1st deadline, non-binding. You can apply to all of our awesome schools and ultimately choose that best fit for you but you have priority consideration for this scholarship for special programs, direct admit programs. Um, so get those applications in, get them out of the way, and, and we're excited to, to review and, and help you through this process. So thanks again for coming tonight. We're gonna keep going um, on to, I think, Vermont. All right. Hi, again, everybody. Um, back to tell you a little bit more about the University of Vermont. So this is going to be brief. Um, we've got a lot more information where this comes from um, available on our website. But uh, the University of Vermont is in Burlington, Vermont, and we were founded in 1791. We're the fifth oldest college in New England. And um, we are a medium sized research based land grant institution. Um, so I think our medium sized that combination of big and small is really a sweet spot. Um, you're small enough that you have more of that academic um, intimacy with your faculty members. You're able to create um, you know, closer relationships, but you also have the opportunities and resources of a large research-based institution kind of right at your fingertips, which is awesome. You might notice that the ratio of our in-state and out-of-state students is a little unusual for a state school. 73% uh, of our students do come from outside the state of Vermont, uh, both across the country and across the globe. And then just a quick breakdown here of the different schools and colleges that we have. Uh, we do offer more than 100 different majors spread throughout these. So a little bit of everything there ranging from, you know, traditional arts and sciences to education, engineering, nursing, business, uh, you name it, I think we have it. <laughs> Next slide, Caroline. Awesome, thanks. So just a couple of things I wanted to highlight um, about more of the, the campus experience, the student life experience. Um, we do always like to highlight that we're, we're old, right? So 1791, we've been around for a while, but we're constantly renewing our programs as well as our facilities to kind of keep up with the ever-changing world around us. So we do have um, a newer residence halls on campus, a brand new STEM complex that opened last year, as well as uh, we're doing some work on a, to create a multi-purpose event center and um, revamp some of our athletic facilities right now. We also have a hospital on campus. The University of Vermont Medical Center and our medical school are literally right in your backyard. So for any students interested in kind of uh, pursuing a, a pathway in those fields, you've got a really great resource right at your fingertips to take advantage of. Um, regardless of what you're interested in studying, you're gonna wanna do some sort of experiential learning while you're in college. And at UVM, you've got a lot of different choices. We had over 10,000 internships posted through our career center last year, both in and around Vermont, at some companies uh, maybe you've heard of or you're familiar with like Ben and Jerry's, 
Burton, um, Keurig, dealer.com. Um, we've got students who are doing internships both you know, in the local area, across the country, and across the globe. Students also have opportunities to do undergraduate research where you're not competing with any graduate students for those positions. And we've got service learning courses and study abroad opportunities as well. So there's a lot of different ways to expand your learning outside of the classroom. Um, we also require students to live on campus. Oops, go back. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we require students to live on campus at least two years to have that uh, residential experience. And we organize all of our students into different learning communities. So these are essentially themed dorms um, with a you know, common interest. You're coming in, you get to know, um, make friends really easily and um, start creating your home away from home. And you'll also take a class with that theme. The themes really are broad. You get to choose which ones you're most interested in living in. And all students got within their top three this year, which is pretty great. Uh, themes ranging from wellness environment to sustainability, outdoor experience, or innovation and entrepreneurship. So there's really a lot of different topics. And then my favorite is always the food at UVM. So I always do a little shout out to the food. 20% uh, of the food in our dining halls is local. Um, I always say the food in Vermont is good and good for you, including the ice cream that we serve in our dairy barn in the student center that is made from the milk of our very own cows at our dairy farm. Um, I don't think you can get too much more local than that. <laughs> Next slide, there we go. Um, so talk a little bit about the um, admissions process at University of Vermont. We are on both the Common App and the Coalition App. We have Early Action, which has a November 1st deadline, and then we have Regular Decision, which has a January 15th deadline. Regardless of which application that you choose to do or which timeline you choose to apply on, all students are reviewed the same way. We do a holistic review of our applicants. So we're um, not only considering your academic preparation, but also kind of your unique background and your story and what makes you you. Um, and we learn those things through like your essays, your activities, your letters of recommendation, um, and all that good stuff in addition to just reviewing your transcript. Um, you can see the average GPA of our applicants is about a 3.7 on a 4.0 scale. And again, if you're not on a 4.0 scale, don't worry, we'll do the math for you. Um, we're considering kind of the rigor of the courses that you've taken within the context of what your school offers. Um, are you taking classes that relate to what you're interested in studying and those kinds of questions. Uh, we do also have um, supplemental essay questions that students can choose to do. Um, they're really fun prompts that are intended to have us learn something else about you that we, maybe we don't see in the rest of your application. Um, this could range from, you know, just why you want to come to UVM or which Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor are you and why, which I'm really looking forward to reading those responses this year. Um, we are also test optional for this year. Um, so if you have test scores and you're happy with them, you think they reflect on your abilities as a student, you are welcome to submit them to complement your other application materials, but you absolutely do not have to. All students are still going to be considered for merit scholarships and for our out of state students, those range up to $20,000 per year. And then um, you would want to complete your FAFSA and get that sent to us. Happy FAFSA day today, guys. It opened up. You can go officially start filling it out. Um, you're welcome to submit that to us so we can send you your full financial aid package of anything else that you might be qualified for. We also automatically review all students for an invitation to join our honors college. So we're not making you do all these extra steps. We're going to take care of that all for you. Um, if you want to find more specific information about our application requirements, you can go on our website. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Caroline to talk about William and Mary, and then we'll take your questions at the end. Caroline, you're muted. I unmuted myself. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, thank you, Candice. Uh, thanks for passing it along. So just a little bit about William Mary, and I apologize for the blurriness. I don't know why it's blurry, but um, a little bit about William Mary. We were chartered in 1693, so we're a little bit old. Uh, we are the second oldest college in the United States. So even though we're the second oldest college, we have a lot of first ourselves. We were the first um, school with a law. We had the first law school, the first modern languages department, the first honor code, the first honor society, and the list goes on. We also have the oldest academic building still in use in the United States today. That's our Wren building. It's featured on a lot of uh, print pieces. It's featured a lot on, on campus and in posters. It is a pretty scenic building. And then a lot of traditions happen out of our Wren building, whether it's the inner Wren courtyard facing our sunken garden or the outer Wren courtyard facing Colonial Williamsburg. And actually with our location in Williamsburg, Virginia, we are about a foot off Colonial Williamsburg, so a big historical neighbor. Um, and then we also are 10 minutes away from Bush Gardens, which is a Europe-themed amusement park. So if you like roller coasters and good food, um, it's available at Bush Gardens. We also have an outlet mall about 10 minutes from campus, so certainly you can do some shopping there. Lots of shopping and restaurants available in Williamsburg. 
We are an hour away from Richmond, Virginia, so certainly a bigger city is not far away. And then we're also an hour, hour and a half away from Virginia Beach, so the beach is not far at all either. And then we're also two and a half hours from Washington, D.C. Now we do have a study in D.C. program where our students can spend the summer, semester, or winter break studying in D.C., taking one of classes, getting credit, living in an apartment in D.C. And then if you choose the summer or semester term, you can also intern in the city as well. Um, actually, it's a guaranteed internship. So you have William Mary credit and an internship under your belt. So certainly if you're at all interested in Washington DC, that's a program worth looking into. And then coming back to campus, I like to share my favorite tradition at, at William and Mary. It's called Convocation, happens in the inner red courtyard uh, on campus. And it's where all new students gather after their first day of classes. So after their last class has ended, they gather on the Colonial Williamsburg side of the Wren Building and they get to hear an alum of William Mary speak. They get to hear the president of the university speak. And then they're ushered through the Wren doors out onto the other side. And on the other side await all the rest of the community of William Mary. This includes students, faculty, staff, even Williamsburg residents, some alums. Um, so pretty exciting. Um, and they get to go single file down this line, get um, to, I mean, you see a picture there, you get high fives, you get um, all these signs saying you belong and the line extends well into the sunken garden. Now it did look a little different this year. It was uh, virtual, but that, that excitement still kept up the whole time. And what I'm most impressed with at Convocation is how that excitement keeps up from the very last or excuse me, from the very first student to the very last student. Um, so really, really special and certainly our new students feel super welcomed uh, going through convocation. I also want to share a little bit about academics at William & Mary. So we have a little over 6,300 undergraduate students um, and that's about small to medium size. Um, and with, with that size, we have uh, gosh, nearly 500 clubs and organizations, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little later on. Uh, about 80% of our undergraduates are involved with research with faculty members by the time they graduate, and a quarter of that 80% are published. So you could certainly be a published researcher at William & Mary by the time you graduate. And research is not just, not just in the STEM areas. I know when I hear research, I think of the sciences, the STEM areas. It can be in the humanities, the arts, the social sciences, or whatever area you're interested in, you can pursue research in. And you can certainly get your research fully funded as well. We have many freshmen that start research right off the bat when they enter William & Mary. We're also very strong in study abroad and actually with study abroad, let me see if it, oh there we go, uh, we were actually rated number one for participation in study abroad uh, for public universities. About 55 percent of our students study abroad. I studied abroad twice in my undergraduate career so I absolutely love talking about study abroad. I studied abroad during the summers because I didn't want to leave campus um, but many of our students uh, they study abroad during the summers and the semester uh, programs, winter and spring breaks, year long terms. Uh, they're kind of limitless there. Um, and we have about 40 or so uh, specific way Murray study abroad programs, but certainly if you don't find the perfect program for you, you can look at other universities, other schools and do their programs and have that credit transfer. So again, limitless. Um, love study abroad, definitely encourage it. And you can get it fully funded. Uh, we have about half a million dollars in scholarship to offer for study abroad alone. Now, in terms of that student life I mentioned, um, and I'm going to share a little bit, oh, skipped a little bit, um, the 500 clubs and organizations, some, I like to, some of them that I like to mention include our Cheese Club, which is actually a very passionate club on campus. They're involved in the Waysburg Cheese Fest. The president of the club is known as the Big Cheese, and they also hold a um, mixer once a year with the Guacamole Club and the Salsa Club. So a lot of food things happening at William & Mary. And then with other clubs that I like to mention includes the Bird Club, which has a lot of bird watching involved in it. Um, and then we also have 45 club sports. We have 16 varsity sports teams as well. We are a Division One school. And then we have a ton of intramural sports games that go, goes on on the weekend as well, where you can win a t-shirt if you win the game. So that gets a little bit of competition in there. And then in terms of applying to William & Mary, you can apply either through the common application or the coalition application. And we have three different decision deadlines. We have early decision one due November 1st, early decision two due January 1st, and regular decision due January 1st. Now early decision one and early decision two are binding. So if you apply ED to William & Mary and you get into William & Mary, you have to come to William & Mary, which is exciting. Uh, that's scary. It's very exciting. But certainly we have regular decision if you want to apply to a bunch of different schools, find out your decisions from there and make your choice. And then in terms of the application itself and looking at that, we do review holistically. So everything you submit, we do take a look at and take into consideration. One thing I do want to point out about the application is we are test optional this year and we're test optional for the next three years. So like Candace mentioned, certainly um, if you do really well and it reflects well um, on your application, feel free to submit. 
if you don't submit a test score, if you're unable to take it or don't do very well and don't want to submit the score, that's okay. It doesn't neg negatively reflect on your application. I also want to point out that we do have an optional essay as well. Um, there's the required essay in your application, then there's an optional William and Mary essay. I do recommend you do the essay. It's a little more information for us. We love that personal part of the application. As deans that are reading these applications, we love that that personal quality. So feel free to, to do that essay. I know it's more work, um, but it's a, it's a great supplement. So that's just a little bit about William Mary. And as you can see on the screen there, those are just some facts and figures. Um, but again, testing totally optional. And for that GPA range, uh, we do take school context. You know, it's all within the context of your school. So I'm going to pass it over to do our Q&A. All right. So guys, we're opening up for, for questions here now. Um, if you want to use that Q&A feature um, that you see in your bar at the bottom, please feel free to go ahead and ask any of us questions. They can be. Um, you know, general college search type questions. They can be university specific for any of us. So if that's the case, um, just specify which school. Um, but if you want an answer from all three of us, that's cool too. Um, so I'll give you a minute or two to uh, write in. Um, give me, get a minute of questions. I wish I had like a like question ready to go for us. Um, you know, Caroline, you said what your one of your favorite parts about your college. So maybe let's say, um, you know, uh, Emily, is there like a tradition or something at uh, Miami that you particularly are fond of? Great start. Um, we are also an old school. Actually, you guys are both older than us, which is crazy because usually we're always so old, 1809. Um, lots of traditions. I have uh, two favorites that I usually talk about um, a lot right now. One is our campus seal. It's this circle thing at the middle of campus. There's like eight different sidewalks that lead right toward it. And then um, the rumor is, and legend has it, is if you step on it, you'll fail your next exam. So you see all these students walking towards the circle and then dart around it. No one steps on it. And then senior year, once everyone has finished their exams, they put on their capping gown, stomp on the seal and take pictures. And it's an awesome tradition. Um, and then my other favorite one is right by there. We have a building that has an arch in it. It's called Upham Arch. Miami has a strange amount of alum that actually get married. We call them Miami mergers. And they say, if you kiss your sweetheart under the arch, um, you'll be married forever. And that's about a month and a half ago, I am a Miami merger. So now that's fun. Um, so that's, that's a couple of fun traditions that I love on campus. Very cool. Um, I think the one I always like to reference for, for UVM is very similar um, to the one at William and Mary. Um, it's a candlelight ceremony that takes place at the beginning of the year when all the new students move in. Um, but it's the entire community that comes together much in the same way. We go um, onto the university green and during that ceremony, the entire community pledges to uphold what we call our common ground, um, which are a set of values that we try to integrate throughout everything that we do at UVM, um, and they are respect, integrity, innovation, openness, justice, and responsibility. So it's kind of one of those, um, you know, events that gives you goosebumps because everyone's coming together, you're excited, you have this common interest, um, you know, and pledge to, to uphold these values for the year. So it's a really cool event. All right. We did have one question come in so far. Guys, don't be shy. Please feel free to ask us anything. We've got plenty of time and that's what we're here for. Um, but for William and Mary, how easy is it to change majors if it's in a different department or school? Oh, great question. So at William and Mary, you come in undeclared. You actually don't declare major until around second semester sophomore year. Um, so you can spend those two years take a, taking a variety of different classes and then deciding on your major or majors um, that second semester sophomore year. And it is absolutely pretty easy to change your major. You're not locked into it, let's say. So basically to declare your major uh, sophomore year, you just complete a one-sided form with your advisor. Um, and then to change your major, you complete a one-sided form with your <laughs> advisor. So um, pretty similar process. Now I will say, we do have two schools at Waymer you do have to apply into, um, again, around sophomore year. That's the School of Business and the School of Education. So aside from those two, all other majors, you know, they just declare using a form. And it, again, it's fairly easy to change it. Even if you're in the School of Business or School of Education, you can always work with your advisor to change your major. Um, so not, not too tricky at all. Yeah, I think that's a great question that a lot of uh, students always wonder, like at all the different schools that they end up applying to. So Emily, how is the process um, for, 
Miami students who want to change their major or aren't sure what kind of major that they're interested in quite yet? Yeah, that's a great question. And for Miami, for most, most of the time, it's easy to change and it's okay to change your mind. I think the average amount of time a student changes their major is like three different times. So no, it's okay to change your mind. For Miami in particular, we have a couple direct admit programs. So if you are thinking about those, um, we encourage you to apply to them directly off your application. Our business school is one of them, the creative arts piece and nursing. Nursing is our only program that you have to start day one your first year. So that's our only area of study that you can't work your way into at a later semester or a later year. Um, but our, our business school, which is direct in our creative arts area, which requires a portfolio or audition, you can work your way in. Um, you can come undecided, you can major in two different departments and you can have double majors that are in the business school as well as in the engineering school. So there's no restriction in terms of what you can study and when you can change your mind, except for nursing at Miami. Yeah, at the University of Vermont, very similar. Um, I'd say undecided is probably our most popular major for first year students coming in. Um, we allow students to apply as undecided to five of our seven schools. Um, so everything except for the College of Nursing or the School of Business can you be undecided in. Which is kind of nice if you think maybe something in engineering or maybe something in education kind of start in those colleges and figure it out. Uh, but it's pretty common for students to change their mind and decide on a different major when they come and learn something new that they didn't know about before. Um, so switching between colleges and or double majoring even between colleges is, is pretty common. But again, some some programs like nursing, sometimes engineering can be a little bit more restrictive to do that. All right, looks like we have another great question here. Um, and I, it's directed towards women, Mary, but I'm going to open it up to all of us because I think this, again, is a concern of a lot of students this year in particular. But how will students um, who defer their admission or returning from a gap year due to COVID-19 affect the freshman class entering uh, for the next year? So either, Caroline, do you want to take that, take it away first? Sure, sure. Um, so as many probably already know, we did have uh, a little more uh, this past year defer. Um, and we're just, we're basically taking it uh, day by day and reviewing numbers. Uh, we don't expect it to affect too, too much. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have this notion of, oh, it's taking spots away um, from this new class. And Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes it's adjusting numbers to accommodate those defers while also realizing that these new students, you know, they're they're applying to this new class and they want to be part of the community too. Um, but it all depends on, on the amount of defers um, and, you know, it depends on if you reach that that number that might affect this incoming class. But for William Mary, uh, we're we're in a good place. So we're looking forward to the applicants for the next cycle. Asked this exact question to our staff recently. Um, for us, we it's not going to affect the numbers of this incoming class. We do have the space, and we're excited and hopeful to have a full incoming class. And then we'll go ahead and stack on those students that did take the gap year um, and, and to be a part of it. So they're not going to take away any placements um, for Miami. So that's good news for us. Yeah, and I would say same as well. I wouldn't. Um... For, our, for UVM, that's not a concern. We're looking forward to welcoming a really uh, robust, diverse student uh, class for this next year too. It's not gonna not gonna affect you for the students who decided to defer or take a gap year. Um, another great question: uh, What does an average class schedule look like? Like, how many classes does does a student take per semester, or how many classes does a student have on average per day? I, I'll go first. We'll switch up the order this time. Um, at UVM. Um, I'd say anywhere between 12 to 19, 18 credits or so is, is pretty popular and credits in college kind of equate to an hour of class time, most classes being about three credits. So you can expect to have three classroom hours for that class during the, the week. Uh, whether that class is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, you're going to have a, a variety, but you'll definitely find that I think you have a lot more free time in between uh, classes than maybe you are used to having in high school. <laughs> um, but so for us, I'd say anywhere between 12 to, to 18 is probably pretty typical. I can jump in. I'd say on, on average, I want to say we say students take about 15 hours a semester. Uh, most classes are about a three hour credit class. 
Um, there's definitely no traditional day. And what's nice about going from that high school experience to college transition is you're going to have to relearn how to manage your time. There will be days where you, where you have class from morning till evening, and there will be days where you have one class in the afternoon. You're like, maybe I'll take a nap. So you'll learn how you function if you're a morning person, an evening person, and you'll be able to, to look at different schedules and see what time classes are offered. Um, so I'd say most students are taking about 15 hours each semester. How they occur in your, in your day and in your week will totally be up to you and what that schedule is looking like for each semester. So um, you'll, you'll definitely figure it out along the way. So William & Mary is very similar to both of your uh, schools. It's about 12 to 18 credit hours. That's the minimum to maximum. So average about 15 credit hours. Um, and students get to decide what time during the day they want their classes to take place. Um, and it, it, I mean, it's pretty exciting. And you know, there's that freedom in there, but there's also that balance that they need to do to make sure that they have that academic and social life, life balanced. Um, but there's that, that average credit hour um, amount. Uh, very similar to, to everybody else. Awesome. So we had another question. Um, are any of our universities particularly specialized in any certain topic? I might even expand that to say, like, what's your most popular major? So we can we can do both. Emily, let, how about you start? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, all of them are Awesome. I'd say in terms of popularity, maybe our business school, I, I hear a lot of students interested in our farmer school of business. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful building. It's an awesome program. One of our direct admit more competitive programs. So um, business for us, our nursing program is amazing. The, the graduation rate for that test is, is high and that pass rate. Um, a couple things that are relatively new but really popular at Miami. Um, we do have a games and simulation major. Um, that's relatively new, number one in the country right now. And as of a couple weeks ago, we're going to have um, robotics. So within engineering and the, the simulation stuff, that's a really strong program at Miami. So if you have any um, interest in that, I'd say check it out. And then, I mean, across the board, we have, we have great, great opportunities. But if I had to pick one area, we hear business, a lot of business interest. And at William & Mary, I mean, I agree, all our programs are, are very strong um, and all uh, have very strong students, very strong departments, um, some really popular majors. Uh, so 40% of our students major in STEM areas. So the sciences, biology particularly is very strong. Um, we have a great strong pool of pre-med students, so that pre-med track typically with biology, but you can major in anything and get that track with it. Um, also in humanities, we're very strong. We have a great history program, as I'm sure you can imagine, being next to Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but it's not just in American history, it's in you know world history, European history, any, any type of um, historical period you're interested in, certainly William Mary excels in those. Also, our business school is, is pretty strong as well. It is competitive to get into our Mason School of Business, and um, it's, it's quite sought after, and it has some really, really great concentrations, and these range from marketing to management to entrepreneurship to um, accounting. I mean, the list goes on, um, so that, that's really strong as well, but I, I'd have to say it's, uh, there are a lot of popular majors. I know it's always a hard question to answer because you're like, all of them are great. Um, I think at UVM, we're a land grant university. Um, and for those of you who don't know, a land grant universities um, are dedicated to education that helps improve the health of our societies. So it's kind of a blend between, um, you know, STEM and, and sometimes agriculture as well as, you know, the liberal arts. And um, I think that kind of mix you'll find throughout um, a lot of different majors at UVM as well. Um, you know, just that sense of purpose and the, the classes in your labs and clubs and all those kinds of things. Um, I would also have to echo though, business is always pretty popular. Um, I think our program, we actually only offer business administration as the undergraduate major. Um, but students then will choose a theme in global business, sustainable business, or entrepreneurship. And then you will also choose a concentration out of marketing, finance, accounting, or business analytics. So I always say business, choose your own adventure. Uh, you get to do a little bit of everything, which is pretty cool. Um, we've got one more question in here. If you guys, we've got time for a few more. If anybody else is out there wondering anything, so please feel free to put them in the Q&A. 
Um, but how will extracurriculars be looked at differently this year since they have been very heavily impacted? Whoever wants to go first. I can jump in. Um, I, I would say know that we get it. We are all going to be as flexible as possible and as much craziness um, that you have gone through trying to figure out high school and our extracurriculars. We've been doing the same stuff on our side, figuring out how to make it work, um, how to make it work safely, what we can still do, virtual options, things like that. So no, we are flexible and understanding. Be as transparent as possible. Um, feel free to, to fill out your essay. On the Common App, there will be an optional area to talk about um, you know, if COVID has impacted anything. Again, that's optional, but if you feel like it has, let us know. Um, so fill it out to your best of your ability. I always say brag about yourself. Um, we do a holistic review as well. So we're gonna be able to, to read it and, and know that we will have this in the back of our mind and we will be understanding. Um, so I think what we're all looking for is just seeing how you adapted um, and, and what you could do and know, have a peace of mind that we aren't expecting you to still have the exact same um, activity, coursework, that kind of thing as you would if this was traditional times. So I would say cut yourself a little bit of a break, express yourself as much as you can, um, and, and know we, we can relate to, to all the different stuff happening. Yeah, I've been kind of saying a similar or message to when I'm talking to students that, you know, this is definitely, you know, a unique situation that we've all been in. Um, we all had our whole lives like shut down for, for many months. There was a lot of things we didn't get to do. Um, but I would like to know like what you did do. What did you do with your time? Did you take up a new hobby? Did you, um, you know, make masks for the community and donate them or, um, you know, just spend time with your family and get to know, you know, a relative or something like that. Like, what did you do with your time? Um, I think that that section in the comment app where you can talk about how COVID has impacted you um, is a great opportunity, again, to show us something about you. Because um, we're also learning that, you know, students are resilient and uh, determined and all these different things that we're going to get from that information, for sure. Um, Caroline, do you want to put our contact information back up one more time um, so anybody can grab it or take a picture of it with their phone or whatever they can uh, to capture that? But if you guys need anything, um, I think I speak for all of us when I say please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we are absolutely here to be your resource throughout the whole process. Um, so please, uh, you know, use that. Use us. Uh, please reach out if you want more information or you need help with anything um, or sometimes just want to chat. That's always good, too. I'll let you guys any any parting words. Well, I mean, I, I was gonna say, that, you know, thank you so much for joining us and, you know, take a deep breath and just, you know, expel it a bit. I hope this this information helped today and just know that we, we are here to help support you and make sure that, you know, this transition is successful, you know, and, and certainly reach out with any questions that you have, we're here to help. Yeah, thank you guys for joining. I know you're, there's probably a lot of Zooming in your life right now, so I appreciate you doing that this evening. Um, check out our websites, contact us, reach out, and, and just thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for, I want to thank our, um, our presenters. Thank you very much for your time tonight. And I want to thank the participants for joining us tonight. Um, there's going to be a quick survey as you close this window. Uh, so if you would take the time to fill out that questionnaire, uh, we do encourage you to sign up for more sessions at the website www.njacac.org backslash virtual fair. And like I said in the beginning, the recording will be available. Um, after this, this happens at the same website. Okay, so um, have a great night and um, stay well.